Good morning. Oh, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Uh, my name is Joe Hewitt. I'm Vice President for Policy, Learning, and Strategy here at the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, and I am just delighted that you could join us uh, today for this event, which I think is going to be really special. Um, I want to welcome you to the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I especially want to welcome our diplomatic colleagues who uh, were able to join us today. I want to welcome uh, everybody who has joined us uh, for the live stream. Uh, I understand that we have a group of students at Avila University who have gathered to join and watch this as well. So welcome to you in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, this is great. This is really great. Uh, look, USIP understands that uh, the causes and consequences of violent conflict are experienced differently by when in, uh, women and girls compared to men and boys. That's just the reality, and we're, we're past the point of debating whether, whether gender matters in conflict. Of course it does. Because we understand that, USIP is committed to the integration of gender into project design, into monitoring and evaluation, uh, into all the efforts that we do in learning. Uh, we have to do that. Our programs won't be effective if we fail to integrate gender into all aspects of our programming. Uh, USIP's slogan is making peace possible. And we know this, uh, that peace is really not possible without the full and meaningful participation of women in conflict prevention and peace building. And so it really is that important. It's a prerequisite. Uh, so uh, we're really thrilled today on International Women's Day uh, to uh, organize this event and do something, I think, very special. Uh, in recognition of International Women's Day and National Women's History Month during March, USIP has organized a series of public events uh, designed to highlight and to further examine the complex roles that women play during conflict and in advancing peace. Um, today we'll celebrate women's leadership and contributions to peace and security and how the power of film can harness, can be harnessed to drive positive change in contexts that have been affected by violent conflict. Um, it is now my very great pleasure to introduce Kathleen Keenest, um, who has been at USIP for more than 10 years, leading the integration of gender into all the work we do. She is the director of the Gender Policy and Strategy Team that's part of the Policy, Learning, and Strategy Center. So please join me in welcoming Kathleen. Wonderful, thank you so much and happy International Women's Day. It is so fabulous to see friends and colleagues here to celebrate this day, thank you. Over the next two hours, we are gonna commemorate International Women's Day by focusing on some of our successes. Please tweet at hashtag Women's Day USIP and all of the panelists' uh, bios in your agenda also have their Twitter handles. So today we're not going to focus on the continuing bad news about women's status in the world. Yes, we know the gaps are big. And we know the challenge is great. And the road ahead is long. Instead, however, we're going to take this time to celebrate what we believe is a great success for women, where we have made progress, where we know that the impact is real and delivering change. Some of the most remarkable successes of the last decade are the result of a genre of film made by women and about women telling their stories of what it is like to be a woman surviving war and building peace. The success 
is one of unparalleled partnerships with filmmakers, NGOs, media, policymakers, and the courageous women that make nonviolent action a calculated path to changing the world for themselves, their families, their communities, and their country. You will hear directly from the change makers who are helping to make the invisible visible by retelling important stories about women through the medium of film. These films have brought forward women's critical voices to the stories of war and peace and have amplified the global agenda of women, peace, and security as it was conceived in UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Reflecting over my last decade here at the Institute, I have seen lasting impacts from these films as they have expanded our understanding of war and peace through the eyes of women. The genre of film has helped shape our ideas, our policies, and our programs. And so we are here today to celebrate this film movement and the individuals who have been making it happen. Before I introduce our distinguished keynote speaker and panelists, I want, though, to take a moment and reflect about International Women's Day. Just after the collapse of the Soviet Union, I was living in a country, a new country called Kyrgyzstan. And during one very incredible winter, cold winter's day, and that's cold because I'm from Minnesota, if I'm saying how cold it was, um, there was this national holiday where all the uh, government was shut down. Suddenly, people were handing me flowers, chocolate, greeting me, congratulating me. And I'm like, what's going on here, right? Well, I had never experienced an International Women's Day here in the United States. And so I was so taken aback by this idea of recognizing women's contribution to the society at hand. So I'm really pleased, two decades later, that International Women's Day is becoming the norm here. And so just to help celebrate it a little bit and to get you moving, because we want to have a really great uh, discussion with you through this uh, panel, um, I'm going to ask you to join me in a little polling. And it's a very simple activity. If you've done this or experienced this, I'm going to ask you to stand up. All right? Very simple? Great. Also, it allows people who are coming in a little late to integrate. <laughs> All right. So how about this? Please stand up if you have ever celebrated International Women's Day. This is a gimme. All right, all right, that's good, that's good. <laughs> all right, you can sit down, look around. Uh, by the way, the United Nations made it an official day in 1975 during the Year of the Woman. But it has actually been celebrated since the early 1900s around the world a whole nother story, a good one though. All right, now I'm gonna get a little bit harder. Please stand up if you have ever met a woman Nobel Peace Prize winner. All right, this is good. Thank you, considering there's only been 16 out of 131, that is a really good showing. All right, okay, this might be a gimme too, but Please stand up if you've ever participated in a non-violent movement. All right, look around. This is going to be a good group today. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and finally, finally, please stand up if you have ever seen the film Pray the Devil Back to Hell. All right, well, that's great, because for all of those who didn't see it, we're going to now introduce a two-minute clip. Because, by the way, this is the 10th anniversary of this remarkable film. And uh, yes. <laughs> 
And uh, so it is really a pleasure to not only introduce the film to you in a two minute clip, but also its producer, Abigail Disney, a filmmaker, philanthropist, CEO, and the president of Fork Films. That's like spoon, fork, fork films, right? <laughs> Just so I wanted to make sure people understand. Uh, as uh, Abby already knows, I'm really one of her biggest fans. I first met her at the DC launch of Pray the Devil Back to Hell in 2008. And I realized then that Abby was blazing a new trail and an important genre of film. As she said it so well that night, we grew up thinking about war through the lens of John Wayne's pith helmet. And what a Abby has done in her notable series on women, war, and peace is bring a new lens of understanding war and peace through the eyes of women. So please well, join me in welcoming Abby Disney to the podium. Well, good morning to you all and happy International Women's Day. And I'm just going to actually ask you to give that the appropriate. Happy International Women's Day! Yeah. That's more what we were looking for. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just want to thank USIP for organizing this, and, and Joe, and Maria, and more than anybody, Kathleen Keenhast, who's been such a champion of this film from the beginning, and such a, an ally and a friend to me. And Sanam Enderlini is here. Um, and Sanam has been at this longer than most any of us. Um, and for um, a long period of time, was maybe the only voice in a lot of rooms saying what she's saying. And that takes a very special kind of courage. So I want to thank her for her years of work. Um, <clears throat> exactly 10 years ago today, I was standing in the town hall in Srebrenica with an audience that was half Muslim and half Serb screening Pray the Devil Back to Hell for the first time for a public audience of any kind. Um, so I, why Bosnia? <laughs> I have to go backwards and explain that. Um, Swanee Hunt, many years ago, also a voice for this issue long before anybody else and very courageously speaking up, asked me to come with her in 2006 to Liberia because we just elected a, they just elected a woman president there and I was interested in women's political leadership and had been a philanthropist on the issue and she thought I could come along and be helpful as a philanthropist. And I said to my husband the night before I left, um, I'm going to a country right out of a civil war. There's still 14,000 UN peacekeepers there. I've never been to a, that kind of a context. And I knew there would be unspeakable suffering and, and it would be hard. And I said to my husband, uh, you know, I'm going to go there and I'm going to see something and it's going to make me feel obligated to do something or say something. And I don't have time to be obligated, right? I don't. I've got busy life and I've got to do the bake sales and take the kids to school and the rest of it. Um, I don't want an obligation on my plate. And he said, well, then that's all the more reason you have to go. You got to go and see what's calling to you. And I thought it would be a sad thing. <laughs> and it was exactly what happened. And it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me personally in my life. Because in fact, I found my life there. And I found relationships and friendships um, that will last me a lifetime, um, and also a, a purpose. Uh, the story of what the women did in Liberia was sort of hanging in the air, just hanging there. People would refer to it and refer to it. It was a little bit like a ghost story, you know, sort of ephemeral and, and, and hovering. And what I now understand as I look back was um, that's what a story looks like right before it disappears right before Sacagawea disappears and right before all the women we know disappear, that's what they look like. It's a ghost story, a nice story, a, an anecdote. Um, and when I heard what the women had accomplished, I remember choosing the single most conventional looking guy I'd ever seen in my life, this British guy with sort of too much gin, so his cheeks were a little pink and he's a little tubby. and. Uh, and I thought, you're really invested in how uh, things need to be normal and describable and the way they've always been. So I'm going to ask you about this story and see if you deny it. And I asked him about it. And he said, no, not only did those women 
bring peace here to Liberia, but there's CNN footage of me climbing out the window um, at the peace talks, and that's when it clicked in for me. Now, I never wanted to make a film, and I didn't go to Liberia with the intention of making a film. Um, and you can only lose with my last name if you decide to go into the film business. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I came home obsessed and uh, eventually got started on Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Now I get invited to go places. I got invited to go to Bosnia when we were almost finished with the film. I think it was the November before um, 2008. And uh, I was in Srebrenica and I was having one of those visits that if you've traveled a lot and you've met with women who've been through conflict and things, you have these meetings where everyone sits in a circle and um, the leader of the group asks them to go around in a circle and tell you what the war was like for them. And these are hard meetings, and I've had a million of them, and they are never fun. Um, but what the women went through in Srebrenica is uh, just beyond comprehension. And what I have encountered in every one of these meetings is not only do they describe to you something that is so beyond your capacity to imagine, um, but they also describe it to you in such a way that they, they, they not only got through it, they, they found a way to become not victims but resources. They found a way to lead. They found a way to remake the story of the worst thing into a story of rising. Um, they were so like the women in Liberia that I have been working with and sitting in an edit room and watching for now over, a little over a year. And so I, as, when, the, when the circle gets around to you, sort of the donor and the person with the magic wand that hopefully can fix everything for them and they're waiting to hear what you have to say, it's very difficult sometimes to find, that's not me, is it? No, that wasn't me. That was you. <laughs> that was my friend. Um, um, you know, it's hard to know what to say in those moments because you don't know whether or not you're going to be able to use your magic wand and fix everything for them. And money isn't going to fix everything for them anyway. Um, but you want to honor what they've said. Um, you want to reflect that you've heard it. Um, but you also want to leave them um, somewhere not in the circling the drain position that you have found yourself in. And so I thought, why don't I try telling them this story? and see how they feel about it. And so I launched into a um, very animated, sorry, pun intended, um, <laughs> version of what had happened uh, in Liberia. And when I got to the end of the story, truly the, room in the, it, the energy in the room had completely altered. And they said to me, you have to bring this film back. It wasn't an option. These women were demanding, and you don't mess with these women in Srebrenica. You do not say no to them. So I promised them I'd come back. And so we organized the screening on International Women's Day. And what happened in that room as the lights came up after the film was astonishing. I'd never experienced it before in my life. But it turned out to be the first of 82 countries, 32 for me. Um, where exactly the same thing unfolded. And it was kind of extraordinary. There was some rustling and people reaching for Kleenexes and the lights are coming up and they're reorganizing themselves. Some of them have been re-traumatized and actually are a little angry about that. But most of them are really sitting quietly and collecting themselves. And there's some uh, reflection on the trauma and the pain that goes on for maybe about five or 10 minutes, um, and then it pivots to someone saying, but that woman reminded me of myself, and that woman reminded me of my cousin, and that woman down the street tried something a lot like what that lama did. And then 15 to 20 minutes, you can set your watch by it, there's a woman who stands up and says, well, that's what they did in Liberia, what are we gonna do in Srebrenica? What are we going to do in Kosovo? What are we going to do in Tbilisi? What are we going to do in the Congo, in the Sudan? And on and on and on. And I felt like the best midwife on the planet. <laughs> because again and again and again, I watched a movement happen right before my eyes. What was so magical about this film? I, I really, you know, I hadn't had any experience in the, in, the, in the women, peace, and security sector. It was sort of a baby sector anyway. Uh, it didn't, in fact, formally exist in a lot of places. Um, but I had been speaking at a kind of theoretical level 
um, for a couple of years with Swanee and other people. I had certainly had myself deeply entrenched in the women's movement locally in New York and across the United States. And so there were certain things that came naturally to me, certain presumptions that I brought with me that, um, that I think were informing our process um, that made us craft a film that was the film that needed to be made. And, and frankly, because I had had so much exposure to women's movements and particularly grassroots women-led movements um, and wasn't of the documentary community. But I had enough of an experience of the language of film um, to understand what, what drove a good story. Um, I think we were able to do what was essentially, we turned it into a bit of a primer, a primer, if you will, for nonviolent organizing. There was, there was so much of the strategy and what these women accomplished, it was um, so remarkable. And so we wanted to make sure that there was a little bit of everything in the film being mocked, um, which is a very important part of trying to dismiss a nonviolent movement and dismiss women's movements. Um, being threatened, of course, always the second thing that happens. Um, the sex strike, which is very important because gender figures into this every step of the way. The feeling of despair and that you'll never get anywhere, which every nonviolent movement encounters, sometimes for long, long periods of time. And one of the most important things was getting home after the victory and not presuming that the victory itself alone was enough, but continuing the work and going forward and continuing to protest. There are so many elements in this that I've seen other movements talk to each other about and speak about. Um, the film has done some extraordinary things. It birthed a, a not-for-profit called Peace is Loud, which is something Jamie's going to tell you about later. And it also spawned this series, um, which reached almost 13 million American viewers, um, called Women, War, and Peace. And, and as Kathleen alluded to, the idea of telling a story about what the women know and when they know it is an entirely different proposition than telling the usual war story. While we were making Women, War, and Peace, there were days when we had four edit rooms open simultaneously. And I would go from Bosnia to Colombia to Afghanistan in a single day, talking about the different circumstances of these different stories. And there were days when the Bosnian women, the Afghan women, the Colombian women would say something in all three different languages that was essentially the same. And it was kind of astonishing, because when you talk to combatants about war, they have a very clear picture of what they're talking about, and it's very particular. They tell you about the weapons and the politics and the landscape and the terrain and the history and the ethnicity and everything. They want to talk about what kind of bullets they were using and, and what was the caliber of the mortar shell that landed in the camp. Women, when they talk about war, they talk about fire, because that's all a missile is, is fire in a missile, in a capsule designed to explode with maximum damaging capacity. They talk about fear. They talk about mourning and grief. They talk about running. They talk about where's the water, where's the food, where's the electricity, where's the education, where's the health care. What women do in wartime, and the reason the Bosnian women and all the women in succession recognize themselves in this film is universal. You know, my grandmother had this expression when I was growing up that doesn't at all mean what I now use it to mean. <laughs> she used to say, the devil is in the details. You know the expression? The devil is in the details because it's hard to get details straight. But the devil is also in details because sometimes if you let yourself be drawn into details, if you let yourself care a lot about the caliber of the missile and not who the missile landed on, um, it's a way of not thinking about what it is that you're actually doing. And I think that that is what happens when we glamorize violence, when we almost eroticize violence in most of our popular culture. I have. Um, I have a theory that when you, when you think about the quintessential soldier, many of us think about Rambo. And many of us think about this guy, and he's sweaty, and he's got these bandoliers, and he's just the essence of masculinity and self-determination and all the rest of this. And this is the image of war that particularly American media has been selling 
around the world for a really long time. I think of the weapons as the hardware and the media as the software. Um, I think women get written out of this story for a very particular reason, and it has to do with the way the details disappear. They are just ephemera in the face of what women truly live in wartime. So if you take that image of Rambo all by himself in the jungle with his AK-47 and surround him with women, and not women and children, please not, let's not ever say that again, women and the children and elderly and sick and disabled and all the lore and the traditional knowledge and the cooking and the access to everything that they need, women and all the things that people depend on them for around him. And he looks completely different. He looks actually horrible. He doesn't look like a romantic person. He doesn't look like a person you want to be. You're, I know that I would think, well, what are you doing, man? Put the gun down. Because the gun has no place in that narrative. Women ruin the narrative. Women ruin war. And that's just exactly the point. So. Um, these films went on to be seen in 82 countries on all seven continents, seven, count them, that includes Antarctica because I am a scrappy, scrappy girl. <laughs> um, but uh, just this year, in 2017, Lema Bowie was back in Liberia screening Pray the Devil Back to Hell to an entirely new generation of young people who were preparing themselves for an election that had everybody on edge. And she was fighting hard to calm the people before the election, lest there be violence. And she wrote me from Liberia and said, you know, I think I forgot to appreciate what we accomplished with that film. Because I am watching audience after audience of high school kids be utterly altered by this. There were two things that people said to me in the aftermath of screenings that I'll always hold with me very dear. One was from the Crown Prince of Norway, Prince Hakon. We showed it in Davos to all the fancy people. Actually, Tita Brown introduced Lema Bowie to Mick Jagger there, and, uh, and she looked at me and said, who's that ugly man? <laughs> he said, he has a neck like a chicken. Um, anyway, um, he said to me, I've always known that it was important that women be involved in peace and conflict resolution. I just could never picture it before. And I feel like I have a picture now. And that is profound because I remember the meetings before the films and they were boring. <laughs> and they were people staring off into the distance and they were people just talking in abstractions and people thinking in theory, none of it was ever gonna hit the ground, none of it was ever gonna have a concrete purpose. But wow, that made a difference. And the other was from a young man in um, Congo, in Kinshasa, who came to us. We had a screening that was predominantly male because we were so stupid, we had a screening after dark. And no woman in her right mind in Kinshasa is leaving her house after dark. <coughs> Nevertheless, it turned out to be a wonderful screening because we had about 40 men there. And one of the men came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I used to think women couldn't really do much of anything. And now I'm feeling kind of differently. <laughs> and that made me so proud. And that um, landed on me along with the emails I've gotten from people who've changed their professions and emails I've gotten from women now who are war correspondents who said, I became a war correspondent because I saw your film in high school. So the high school teacher I just encountered two days ago who told me I show it every semester to every class I have. Um, I feel like the, the fact that we were telling their story from their point of view is what made a difference. Stories matter. One of the most important things that I was disciplined to do by my partner and amazing genius director, Ginny Redeker, was stop telling people things. Stop giving them information. Information will kill story. Its story is the heart. It's the same as caring about the caliber of your weapon as opposed to what's actually happening in story time. And voices matter. You know, the bottom across the street has never been foggier. <laughs> um, but peace comes from the bottom up. That's the thing I have learned more than anything else. And 
empowering the women at the ground level to do what it is that comes most naturally to them. We will stop seeing them as victims and people who suffer in wartime. We will understand them as the repositories of every single thing that we need for profoundly building peace in a constructive way in the 21st century. Thank you. While everybody, uh, with the panelists are joining us here at the front of the stage, would you just take a moment around you, and if there's somebody you don't know, please introduce yourself oh. to them. This is a great audience, and you should just, just take that second. It's not any day. It's beautiful. Thank you. They, they changed the podium. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah, it's great. It's like, it's like a birthday party. It is. <laughs> so your water is there. Great. And if you need anything, please do that. Oh, it's good. They're doing just fine without us. Yeah, they run on their own. Oh. Okay. <coughs> All right. All right, I think we're uh, back at it. Whoops. Whoops. All right, now that I've... All right, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, that just warmed up the whole uh, auditorium here. And uh, now we're going to get into a uh, discussion and uh, also a, a discussion with you all. But first, we're going to hear from each of our panelists here today. And I want to first introduce our co-moderator, my colleague, my friend, Maria Stefan. Uh, Maria is the director of the program on nonviolent action here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, she has a remarkable background, uh, and I'm going to ask you to refer to her bio as we're going to very briefly introduce all our distinguished panelists. Uh, for the sake of time, forgive us, because they all have amazing, amazing background. So. We want to kick this off. Each one of our panelists is also going to share a brief uh, video of their work. And so you're going to get a nice uh, kind of sense of, like I call this, the genre of the women, peace, and security films. Uh, Abby has set the framing because really what we're talking about is how these films have made impact. And we hope you walk out of this room today going, and thinking differently about the role of film in changing minds and hearts, and as you pointed out so well, Abby, changing direction of people's lives, including your own. So um, I'm going to begin here with uh, Jamie Dolby, is the executive director of Peace is Loud. It's not quiet, it's loud. That's right. And uh, it is a leading nonprofit that uses personal narratives to expand the reach and influence of women at the decision making tables. Jamie, tell us about how this kind of work has come to be, like Peace is Loud and also this series, and begin talking a little bit about that impact. Sure. Well, thank you, Kathleen, and thank you, Maria and USIP, for providing this opportunity for the women, peace, and security community to come together around storytelling. Um, it's really exciting. It's the space that Peace is Loud operates in, and it's a fun way to celebrate International Women's Day. So thank you. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the director of Peace is Loud, and we are a nonprofit founded by Abby that, as she said, kind of grew out of her work on Pray the Devil Back to Hell. 
uh, when she and her director, uh, Jeannie Redeker, began screening the film, as you heard, for women globally, uh, you know, they, they realized pretty quickly what a universal story uh, this was. Women, they were at the center of, of conflict and peace building efforts all across the globe, but the platforms didn't really exist for their stories to be told because as Abby you know, very eloquently said, the story of war was so often and is so often the story of combatants and, and perpetrators. It's, uh, you know, it's the, the story of men. And so Abby and Ginny together with WNET and PBS turned Pray the Devil Back to Hell into the five part series, Women, War and Peace to look at conflict through the eyes of women in Afghanistan, Bosnia, Colombia, and, and Liberia, as you heard. And Peace is Loud was launched as the impact partner for the series um, and as an organization that would focus on using media you know, beyond the series to expand the reach and influence of women peace builders. Um, we've since grown Peace is Loud to include a speakers bureau. We have a, a whole impact campaign service arm for documentary films. Uh, we have a women's political participation program, Mina's List. But Women, War, and Peace is our origination story. And so I'd like to just show a short trailer um, from the first series, which many of you in the audience have, have uh, probably seen. And then I'll talk just a little bit about, uh, about its impact and what we've learned along the way and how we're uh, building a new campaign um, with, those, with those lessons. So, so I, I want to share a quote um, from former Ambassador Milan Verveer uh, reflecting on the series just recently. Uh, she said, when Women, War, and Peace aired on national public television, it was the first time the idea was put forward into mainstream media that the full participation of women in public life is essential to building strong, vibrant democracies. The series made this concept relatable and urgent, and it changed the way women's participation and rights are talked about around the world. And I share the quote because you know, it's the idea of making women, peace, and security relatable and urgent that is at the heart of our work at Peace is Loud. You know, I, I, I believe strongly that storytelling has the power to create empathy and understanding, to change beliefs, perceptions, priorities, the way we all live in the world. Um, and we've seen Women, War, and Peace do this um, in partnership with so many of you in, in this room. We've seen how the series has advanced main tenets of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. And there are just a few ways I'll touch on you know, briefly that, that I think we've, you know, we've seen this series um, operate. One is you know, the films, they really inform and mobilize you know, people. They translate kind of, you know, uh, sometimes wonky policy issues for, for general audiences who aren't sort of well-versed in, in the policy agenda. And that's important because you know, it's, it's general audiences who, for example, in the US are the constituents who put pressure on policymakers to change the way that they legislate. Um, as Abby said, over 13 million people saw the series on PBS when it first aired, and that wasn't just coast, that was all across the country. Um, and we built a social media uh, audience across our platforms of 70,000 people, and that's continuing uh, continuing to grow today. You can follow us, Women, More and Peace, on, uh, on Facebook. It continues to be a really engaged community. Um, and that awareness raising is, you know, I think the culture change work that takes time. And the results aren't necessarily as kind of immediate and, and neatly kind of packaged for, for funders as the clear cause and effect. This film, you know, uh, influenced this passage of this piece of legislation. And that work is, is important, but I would argue that the culture change work is, is just as important. And in trying to kind of measure that and capture that a little bit, what we did with the first series was we worked with a group of computer scientists out at University of Illinois to do a kind of semantic analysis study and look at media discourse on the topic of women, war, and peace. Um, and what the analysis showed us was over a period of time, both prior to the broadcast uh, and then after, uh, after the series was, was launched, there was a significant increase in media coverage on women in conflict from stories of just women as solely victims of human rights abuses, kind of in need of protection, to stories of women as actors, negotiators, human rights defenders, and witnesses. So so that felt really significant. Um, second, you know, the films have been used as advocacy tools um, all over the world, as Abby uh, mentioned, by practitioners to build constituencies and also to uh, you know, influence policymakers. We've seen the films used to advocate
asking for country national action plans for more effective implementation of 1325. Um, just, uh, just last year, which is a full six years after this series came out, the films were used in countries, uh, Uganda, Kenya, the DRC, South Sudan, Burundi, to advocate for inclusive peace and security processes. Okay. So the films just continue to, um, to serve this, this purpose. And lastly is, you know, we've seen the films um, used effectively as educational resources and tools. And I would say that's especially important um, with the newly uh, passed Women, Peace, and Security Act, which calls for um, you know, uh, more kind of robust training and education on women, peace, and security. I think storytelling has an extremely important role to play in classrooms. You know, I'd argue, and you know, the, the agenda is, can be very broad, the women, peace, and security agenda. Um, it encompasses a lot of ideas, and, and you know, sometimes there's even you know, conflict within the community about you know, where the focus of the agenda should be. Is it about women's inclusion and peace processes? Is it about women's political participation? Um, and I think it's about all of those things. It's not kind of mutually, those ideas aren't mutually exclusive. And I think film, you know, it can present all of those ideas and truths together and really invite reflection, so. Wonderful, thanks so yeah. much. I'm gonna turn it over to Maria. Yeah, I have the honor of asking Suad Baba the first set of questions. So Suad is the executive director of Just Vision and your organization just released a new documentary film called Nyla in the Uprising about the little known story of nonviolent resistance led by women, Palestinian women during the first intifada of the late 80s. Uh, and it's also part of the second Women, War and Peace series. Um, and now the popular depiction of the first intifada is not necessarily one of nonviolent resistance. So what is the story that you wanted to tell? Why did you do this film? Maria, thank you. That's a fantastic question. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yeah, fantastic. Um, it's really wonderful to be with all of you t today on International Women's Day. Um, and in order to get to the heart of that question, I wanted to take a step back to share a little bit about Just Vision and who we are. I'm, I'm the executive director. I have the privilege of leading a team of filmmakers, storytellers, journalists, and human rights advocates. And we tell the stories of Palestinians and Israelis who are working to end occupation and build a future of freedom, dignity, and equality for all. At the end of the day, our work is about finding the role models who embody those values and then amplifying their work so that they can inspire others, gain traction and influence, both within their communities, across communities, and certainly in the international community where so much of this work on Israel-Palestine is happening and so many interventions for better or for worse and mostly for worse these, these days and for the last several decades um, are taking place. Um, and Part of the reason that we do this work at, at, in its essence, and, and Abby beautifully spoke to this, stories matter deeply. And they, they matter across issue areas. This is true, too, of Israel-Palestine. When we look at this, the dominant stories that are making it into the news on the Israeli-Palestinian context, I think most of you would agree with me that the stories tend to reinforce this narrative of violence and top-down political failure. Literally, politicians running around in suits, running the show, um, or about their latest political scandal, um, or armed men front and center. And that story tells us a very problematic narrative. It tells us that this is intractable, that this is never going away, this is always how it's been, and there's nothing that we can do about it. It also misses the very people who are doing something about it. It misses the courageous community organizers, the activists, the journalists, the voices of dissent, the everyday civilians, everyday folks like you and me, who are putting their bodies and lives on the line nonviolently to create a different future in the region. And we believe that those stories have tremendous power in changing the narrative on this issue, inspiring people to get involved, and also moving people to action, as I think Jamie so beautifully spoke about in the sort of um, numerous ways that film has galvanized um, action and galvanized change. Now, I'm sitting, I wanna speak very specifically to this question of women's stories. Why women's stories? Now, for me, um, that question is answered both because of the values that drive me and also because of strategy. It's about what works, right? I'm, I'm gonna, in transparency, I'm a feminist. I will claim that identity through and through. I believe in the inherent equality of every human being. I believe that women, like every other human being, should be at every single table. I also believe that women's inclusion is an indicator of how pluralistic our societies truly are and truly can be. And so I think that there's important value there. 
But it's also, a, it's about what works. Understanding the role of women's leadership is understanding what works. I'm sitting on a panel with some of the foremost experts in the field, people who have studied and researched the role of women in nonviolent civil resistance movements. Maria has been someone who's informed our work. I've been following Abby's work for such a long period of time with great admiration, and Sanam, and Jamie, and Kathleen. And what we've seen in the research is that um, for political and social movements, um, they are most likely to succeed when they're nonviolent. Now, what's even more striking to me is that um, whether a movement is able to maintain a nonviolent strategy has nothing to do with its political leanings. It has nothing to do with how repressive a regime is. It actually, the greatest predictor is actually the way that movement orients its ethos around women in public life and leadership. That's profound. Now, we've seen that reinforced in our work in Israel-Palestine time and again. We've been in the field for about 14 years, and a few years ago, we began um, research for what would become Nyla and the Uprising. Now, when we began that research, we were compelled by two things. One, many of the activists that we had worked with um, for the last decade had shared with us, look, um, the first intifada is this iconic period of Palestinian nonviolent civil resistance. Um, it's the most important period of Palestinian history in terms of the resistance movement on the ground, in terms of what it achieved. And yet, this ephemeral quality what did it, that Abby referenced earlier, what did it actually look like? What did it take to pull off? Our generation, people who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, have very little access to what that looked like. Now, the second piece of that was that the dominant narrative internationally in particular, I mean, for those of us who lived through that period, the dominant images are likely gonna reinforce the very same tropes that we see in the media around this issue today. Um, incident by incident reporting that zooms in on stone throwing, Molotov cocktails, military incursions. And what we knew was that that story was incomplete at best that what it missed was the marches and the tax strikes, the boycotts, the sit-ins, the victory gardens, the underground classrooms. All nonviolent civil disobedience tactics tried and true time and again in some of the greatest social movements of our time from the US civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s to India's struggle for liberation to the movement to end apartheid in South Africa to Liberia and so on. And yet those stories were not documented in the way the story was told. And so we wanted to find out and tell, and, and tell that story. Now, what surprised us in our research, um, and also that what was very, um, what was actually even less documented and very little known in both Palestinian and Israeli society, um, was, was really interesting to us. We knew that women participated in the movement, right? Part of the reason the first intifada was so successful was that it was able to mobilize, and mobilize, very different than what I'm about to share, mobilize across gender, age, class, political factions. What we didn't realize was the 18 months that are considered the most disciplined and effective period of that movement, women were at the helm. They were literally calling the shots and were thrilled to be tag teaming with Fork Films and Pieces Loud, is to make sure that people like Naila Ayish and the thousands of others like her are celebrated, but importantly, that their legacy and their lessons are passed down to the next generation. They did something remarkable. They were able to put Palestinian people on the map, literally forcing the world to recognize the right of self-determination for the Palestinian people for the first time. They changed the course of diplomatic relations on this issue. Importantly, they also understood that their own freedom was bound up in confronting gender inequality as they struggled for self-determination. When we talk about intersectionality today, when we talk about the importance of looking at holistic issue areas, looking at our communities holistically, um, they were ahead of their time, ahead of the game. But we also know that these stories are important not only for the, those rising in Israel and Palestine, they're also um, important lessons for communities around the globe. We're all wrestling with some very deep questions right now about the role of our communities, the role of the grassroots, what leadership looks like, what we should be demanding of our political leaders when we're thinking about the well-being of all of our communities. And you know, when I think about the reason that I do this work, what inspires me to do this work is very much bound up with impact. It's knowing that and seeing firsthand, time and again, what happens when audiences see stories like this. 
when Palestinian community organizers tell us that after seeing a story like Boudrous, our last feature length film, their community held the most disciplined and well attended nonviolent action to date. When I talk to young Israelis who tell us that after seeing stories like this, they can no longer serve in the Israeli military. By the way, they're mandated to enlist in the Israeli military. It is considered one of the highest badges of honor in Israeli society. So when you have a conscientious objector, it means something profound. I'm, I'm inspired when I'm working with young folks and organizers who are working with dreamers in Arizona border communities in Texas, organizing around racial justice in St. Louis, and they see something like Nyland Uprising and they say to me, can I please use this as a tool in my own organizing efforts? Because the systems that we're facing look very familiar even though they're different and the inspiration is one and the same and the best practices are something that are universal. That to me is inspiration, that's impact. I'm looking forward to talking a little bit more about what we've seen in the research around our work. Um, when we get into q and I also know that each of the panelists will be speaking more on this question of impact, both qualitatively and anecdotally, as so many of the storytellers in the room know intuitively. Um, and I'm looking forward to diving in and following up on that. Great, thanks so much to her. That uh, really adds a, a fuller dimension to our, our conversation here today. Um, our next uh, panelist is Sanam Anderlini, who may be well known here around Washington. Uh, she's also well known around the world. She's the executive director and co-founder of International Civil Society Action Network, otherwise known as ICANN. She had a pen in helping to craft the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and is a formidable voice for women around the world living in war. Sanam, why is it that these films have been so effective in your opinion, especially around the issues of women and peace building? And tell me a little bit about how you've integrated it into your own work. Thank you, it's great to be here. Happy, happy International Women's Day, everyone. Um, it's 101 years that, that this day exists, so it's fabulous to see it continue and growing. Um, as I hear the, the various speakers and, and kind of reflect back on, you know, I started this work in 1996. So um, it, it's interesting to see the evolution. And, and it comes down to a few things. Number one, money. We didn't have the resources. We got Resolution 1325 with a grant of $180,000 from the Ford Foundation at the time, which included mobilizing around the world, having to do posters, having to do going into regional meetings and so forth, and making it to the Security Council, right? Um, that was all the money we had. Now, to combine that with the technology uh, of the time, photographs, digital photographs, printing, film, film was so beyond the scope of um, of, of the resources that an NGO could have, let alone women's organizations on the ground and, and so forth. So, so the fact that technology has enabled us now to actually have good images and be able to share them is extraordinary. The fact that um, we see, I mean, the, the, the financial question I think is still a problem because even in my own organization, if I'm, and you'll see, I'll, I'll show you a clip now of the animations that we do, but if I'm thinking, am I gonna spend $5,000 on pre producing a five minute animation versus $5,000 that I could be giving to, you know, as a grant to our Tunisian partner who's here or, or to our Afghan partner or to our Yemeni partner, that $5,000 on the ground goes an awful long way. It really, truly does when it's in the right hands, right? So, so the, the financial side of the story is always a question that we have to address. But at the same time, um, for me, it's always been about storytelling also. I, I'm, a, I'm a writer, I'm a, I, I, I like creative writing, I was in marketing before I even came into this, into this field. So this idea of how do you communicate ideas and how do you get people sort of bought into it, it's not an intellectual exercise, it really is about getting to the heart to then get to the mind. Um, and, and so it, it's, always been a, it's always been there and, and, and I think about it because the first time I came across this idea of women being out there and literally living in this parallel invisible universe from the standpoint of the international community was sitting in a room in 1998 in London. Uh, we had been talking about women around the world, women's act peace activism around the world and we did a conference where we brought 50 women from 50 different conflict zones and it was that universality that Abby's talking about from Guatemala and from Afghanistan and from Palestine and, and from Rwanda it was, and it was for me personally um, as I, one of the stories that struck me was 
uh, an, a Rwandese woman who, um, it was four years after the genocide, 800,000 people had been killed in a country with seven million population, right? So, so we're talking about over 10% of the population. And this lady sp stood up and she said, I have to work for peace, we have to work for the future, we have to reconcile, we have to think about what comes next for, for, future, for future generations. And I kept looking at her eyes, and, and it was, they were those saddest eyes I had ever seen, and I was you know, all of, I don't know, 26, 27 years old. And, um, and I discovered later that she had lost 100 relatives in the genocide. And I come from a gigantic family, we're all over the world, and it's the only thing that kept, has kept us sane in, in 40 years since the, since the Iranian Revolution. It's the, it's the fact that you belong to a family, not, we don't belong to any place anymore. And I, and, I, and I sat there and I thought, I don't know what I would do if anybody touched one of my relatives, let alone a hundred of them, right? I don't know whether I would have it in me to become a peace. To, to look beyond and, and try and take something so horrific and bring something so extraordinary out of it. And that's what put me firmly in the space of saying, I'm gonna work with women because I kept hearing those stories. My colleague Visaka in Sri Lanka lost her son and she went and talked to the Tamils, right? It's in Syria right now, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in all of the places we're working. Even in the United States, I came across women who had lost their, their sons in, in the towers in 9-11 and they decided to set up nonprofits to work um, on, on issues of social cohesion. It, it's, on the one hand, it's, there's a universality around it. On the other hand, these are extraordinary people because many people can become angry or despondent. But if you find that gem of a person who can take out of adversity and do something extraordinary, they're the people I want running the world, right? And they're the people that I will do anything for to enable their voices to, to be heard. So that's really the starting point for me. Now, in the, in the 25 years that I've been doing this, I've written books, I've written papers, I've, you know, I've talked, all, all sorts of stuff. And we, we went from a place of people saying, what, women, peace, security, what, to why, why women, women are victims, to, oh, okay, um, yeah, 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 we have this resolution, yeah, yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it, it's, really, it, 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 it's really our values, it's all their values, right? So, so you have all these variations of this thing. To finally the point where, it's like, okay, so we get this, now how do we do it? What is it that you want us to do? Um, and for me, that was where I was like, we've written all this stuff, somehow it's not resonating. I'm dealing with mediators, UN mediators, who I used to think were like the best in the world and, and you know, all these guys that run around trying to save the world, um, who would say things to us uh, such as, um, don't give me things to read, I want it on the size of a credit card. Right? These are people who are, who are meant to go out and deal with Syria or Yemen, and they wanted the information on one piece of paper because, I don't know, they couldn't be bothered to read. I'm not sure what the problem is. I like to read, but whatever, right? <laughs> so so this, this challenge of, on the one hand, the, the what and the how and the why to make it really resonate with their, with their hearts. On the other hand, the fact that they're not gonna read and everything has to be in bite-sized forms. So. Um, I basically, I was like, what else can we do? And I'd seen animation. It had been very expensive a few years before, but we figured out how to, you know, was, there, were, there was new technology. And, and so I decided, well, why don't we try animation and try and do a, you know, four minute, five minute pieces that take, it's like chewable pieces of this agenda and just start explaining it through animation. Our partners around the world actually translate the material for us. So, so we have in Tamil and Urdu, we have it in Japanese, Chinese, Arabic, Spanish. And any, frankly, anybody who wants to translate, we, we give them the script and, and, and then we, we do, the, uh, we, we do the, the, the voiceovers. But what's amazing for me is that it's being used in Syria. It's being used in all sorts of places we don't know. Sometimes we get emails from people saying, you know, we just did this with communities in, in various places. I use them in my own trainings with, with, at the senior, high level senior uh, mediation training for, for the UN. And it's, these are the special representatives and the envoys. I also use it for the staff. And I remember the, the current head of the UN Department of Political Affairs, when he saw it, um, he said those images, that image, that last image, the images of those men with the guns and the women, that keeps sticking in my mind. And these, this, this was really important because we're talking about paradigm shifts. I can't tell you how difficult it is to say to people, just because they have a gun shouldn't be the qualification to the table. Just because they have a gun doesn't mean they're the only actors. There are other actors. When I was in Somalia, it was all about power sharing. It, there was a famine going on. 
And I was like, for God's sake, you want to share power. What about responsibility for the, for the famine? So the framing of responsibility sharing was something that I brought into the UN discourse in the spaces that I was in. But through these animations, we're now making sure that it's in, that, in those higher level spaces. But very importantly, it's also it being spread in the spaces in real time where people are struggling to get their voices and the women are getting their voices. Thanks for bringing in that other element of how you're working with UN and others to change that paradigm. So Eric Martin, who is a senior strategist at Independent Television Service, we've uh, had a conversation about poignant anecdotes of examples of how film has inspired uh, social change. But how do we really know that it's working? Now, your organization just released probably the most uh, comprehensive study done to date on the impact of uh, documentary film in an international development setting. What did you find from that study? Well, thanks so much. Um, I'm the odd one out in a lot of ways on this stage. It's great to be here. Um, let me lean in a little bit. <laughs> so, ITVS, the organization I work for, is the largest funder and presenter of documentary film for public television in the US. Um, if you're a filmmaker out there, you've either come and asked us for money or you will one day. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we fund films, so you, we know our films. Um, there are films like I Am Not Your Negro, this year's uh, Academy Award nominated Abacus, um, The Interrupters, and Ron Waltz with this year, the list goes on and on. And uh, once upon a time, there was a film called Pray the Devil Back to Hell that we were a partial funder of as well um, and went on to fund part of Women, War, and Peace. That was actually the beginning of kind of an extraordinary chapter for us. Um, I don't know if it was the timing of, your, of what you were working on, but the, the floodgates of stories about women um, in international settings sort of opened up and we brought in tons and tons of films and it led to a project that I'm gonna share the evaluation of called uh, Women and Girls Lead Global. Why don't we just roll the clip of that and give you a quick sense of what that was about. Or I could act it out. <laughs> <laughs> Interpretive dance. <laughs> Do we have the clip? Well, I can keep talking okay. while you look for it. Um, so, Women and Girls Lead Global grew out of this work that we had done in the US for years and years. What we'd been doing is showing our films on public television here in the United States, um, doing engagement screenings, and often being invited here in Washington to show films for policymakers. And some of those policymakers over USAID started to ask us, well, what if we could actually use these films to support very specific changes that we're going for in our global development work? Do you think you could do that? And we're like, we have no idea. That's not what we do. That's what you do. And so they teamed us up with um, behavior change specialists at, uh, at USAID and in this world of Washington where people uh, talk like that. And <laughs> we worked with USAID and the Ford Foundation um, to craft this uh, project, Women Girls League Global. Um, do we have the clip or not? Should we just skip it? Skip it, okay. Um, so Women and Girls League Global was a project Five years, five countries, 37 films, 60 partners, 21 local objectives, at least 45,000 people reach really directly, plus millions on television. The study that we got a couple weeks ago was done by the Aspen uh, Planning and Evaluation Program. And they were with us every step of the way. And what they were looking at was how do these films actually impact at the local level in the way that the development practitioners think about? Not in terms of policy, not in terms of advocacy, but what happens actually when you, when you show these films and how can we study that? And what we found was really interesting. Even though we used the same group of films, these are independent documentary films that were not made for use in global development. They are made by storytellers. I loved what you said about Storytellers who are really looking for that authentic voice. They're, these people are storytellers who are drawn by the characters. They're not necessarily trying to change minds and change behavior. They're just drawn to the story. But what we know is that spark, as storytellers, what we know is that spark can actually promote those changes. So the study, uh, and it's 178 pages, so there's something in there for everyone. Um, <laughs> you can find it at womenandgirlslead.org. 
What the study shows is that even though these films were used in completely different settings, often for completely different purposes, the same kind of films, and Pray the Devil Back to Hell was one of the films that we used, the same kind of films can be used to promote girls' education in Peru, child marriage prevention in Bangladesh, gender-based violence prevention in India and Jordan, leadership in Kenya. These are the things we worked on with those same body of films. And that spark that happens at the screening, what the study found was that they could move the practitioners in those facilitated screenings, and we did a series of three screenings. We would t take three films, and people would come to a first screening, a second screening, and a third screening. And over that course, we could move the dial 15 to 30 percentage points on pretty much a hugely wide range of knowledge and attitudes, um, depending on the country, depending on what they were working with. Now, the next step, of course, is behavior change. And behavior change varied much more widely because that's where really the NGOs on the ground are the ones, they're the ones that take that spark and turn it into whatever happens next. And you've heard some great examples of what can happen next. Um, but in the Bangladesh example, for instance, where we had really amazing partners, including the Ministry of Education, in the 280 schools where those films were used, over those five years, the child marriage rate dropped from one in 20 to one in 100. And it was pretty much the same drop for girls dropping out of school. And that was statistically significant compared to the control schools. So what we feel like we have in this evaluation is part of a growing body of evidence that's not just coming from us, but coming from other people here and other people out there in the documentary film and social change world that really shows that these films, it's almost like the role of art. These films are made as art, but art can be used to promote very tangible, very measurable social change. And so for practitioners out there who are looking for new ways and innovative ways to change the world, documentary film is a valid and now measurably proven way to do that. And I can't wait to talk because there's so many things to talk about, but I'll just leave it there for now. Absolutely. Well, and uh, we still might get your clip here. So okay. thanks so much for your patience on that. Abby, you've listened to all this. Interested in this this catalyst what do you think yeah. and what's next well <clears throat> um, many years ago um, one of the sparks for my interest in all this was writing my PhD dissertation in the English department at Columbia and um, I wrote it about war novels and I was very influenced um, <clears throat> by a book by Paul Fussell a British scholar called the great war and modern memory <clears throat> and the book was essentially about how the literature that came out of World War I was very much determined by the fact that the, that the young men from England who went to fight in World War I had all read the same books and been educated in the same literature. And so when they went, for instance, um, to Ypres where the, you know, and the Somme and, and the places where the, the, the earth was completely devastated by the number of mortar shells, um, they, were, they were thinking about Arcadia, they were thinking about the forest, they were thinking about natural scenes in a particular way. And so one thing came up against the other and generated this feeling of irony, the, and which, you, which characterizes all the literature that comes out of that war. Um, Ernest Hemingway very famously talks about how the word heroism is drained of all meaning and honor is drained of all meaning by the war, and that came from a notion of honor um, that you know had been started with Homer and through Tennyson and all the way into World War I. So there were all these frames of reference that gave the soldiers the way they went into the war and very much determined the way they behaved during the war and then what came out as literature, which influenced the next group of soldiers going into World War II and so forth. So the interesting thing is we think of stories as things we mine reality for, um, but they also generate reality in large measure. And um, one of the things, one of the narratives, one of the stories that we tell and retell, particularly in American society, is the hero story. We love the hero story. We're a society of individuals. We, we think of the world in terms of 
individual achievement and fame and getting rich and being an accomplished person. And we don't think in collectives, we don't think in groups. And so the stories we want to attach to tend to have heroes or a central figure driving them, which is why we focus on Gandhi, why we focus on King and Mandela, knowing full well, in fact, that there's a collective story behind all of them and no single person. It's the same with bad guys. And um, that narrative, is giving us the reality that we live. You know, that narrative is why every journalist missed the story that was lying there in Pray the Devil Back to Hell. They all walked past it because it didn't relate to any narrative they understood. They had been raised on the hero narrative, they went to Liberia looking for a hero narrative, and they came out of it without one because they couldn't, couldn't recognize a collective story. Um, there's a real resistance in, in media to the role of women and putting women at the centers of their stories because they have a way of forcing collectivity. You know, I've been working over the years in a lot of different women's organizations and it is really hard to step into leadership in these organizations. This is the worst thing about us is we have a tendency to pull each other down. But I wonder if that's the flip side about the, of the best thing about us. Um, which is that we seem to be more comfortable working in horizontal lines rather than in vertical lines. Um, so what's next is, I think, um, we're sitting in a moment where media is flattening. Media is democratizing. Media is spreading horizontally and, and, and becoming less of a vertical affair. And I wonder if that is the perfect environment um, in which for women to really thrive um, in terms of making sure that our stories are heard, in terms of making sure that, that, um, that, that these collective narratives and the narratives that constantly get passed over, even when they're sitting in plain sight. I mean, as, as Suhad was saying, they're sitting right there in front of you and they get passed up again and again and again. Um, I wonder if the popularization, the democratization of the means by which we make media will in fact lead to a, a different narrative starting to prevail um, and maybe creating a different consciousness um, going into the way we talk about war, the way we talk about peace going forward. Um, we're fighting gravity in a lot of ways, you know, and, and so you see so many movements where there's a, a relatively happy ending, but then you go back afterwards and it's a little bit of a sad story. I mean, uh, frankly, Liberia is a bit that way. And um, we really fought in Trials of Spring um, because we were trying to tell a story that wasn't quite as depressing as it turned out to be. Um, so, so many of these movements get dragged, you know, back into the mud. Um, and, and that is partly because um, the, the way the world is constructed rewards um, the kind of behaviors and the seeking of individual fame and glory and, and power um, in a way that um, just can't tolerate uh, the way women operate. Um, so it, it is going to take all of us pretty much never ever taking our foot off the gas because it's, it's gravity, but it's not eternal gravity, I don't think. We don't have to fight gravity forever. We, this is the place where we can change gravity. It's just that we have to recognize and dedicate ourselves to the idea that we won't see it in our lifetimes. And the great people shoot for things that happen after they die. And so that is the question. Will we all commit ourselves to building a better future that perhaps we'll never see? No, that's, that's a great um that's a great way to prompt a, a wider conversation with the audience. We're going to open up the questions, or the, we're going to open up the floor to you all in just a couple minutes. But one, one question I wanted to ask the full panel, um, and you mentioned the hero story, and we tend to focus on the individual vice, the, the collective. And I found, at least you know, in my work with activists and movements, the film A Force More Powerful has had particular allure and power because it does focus on the collective, the strategies, the tactics. And it has protagonists, but it gets at kind of the organizing and the, the collective action element. But when it comes to uh, the role of film, how, how do films go from being sparks and catalysts to actual tools of social change? So what does it mean to embed a film in a social change organization and movement and see it work effectively? 
The floor is open. I just, can, I just want to give a flip side to this, which, which is, uh, I came across it recently. Um, so on the one hand, you know, we've been, well, many of us have been used to this idea that there were no images of any of these wars, none of the peace work and so forth, right? And, and partly it continues because the folks that are in it real time, you can't necessarily go film them right now. It's too dangerous, right, to, or to expose them. So, so we always have this challenge. But I have a Syrian colleague who is all of 22 years old. She grew up in the middle of this Aleppo, you know, in, in Aleppo, in the middle of the war. She went to Aleppo University. She became a humanitarian actor. And then she became, she has become a peace activist, and, and, um, and actually she's in New York right now, but she became a peace activist. And I saw her recently and she said, um, she said people ask me, why, why have you become a peace activist? And she said, because I was doing the humanitarian work and it was like band-aid, it just didn't stop. And then one day on April such and such in 2013, somebody sent me a video clip of my university being bombed. And I saw it and I got a call and they said, everybody you know has died. And that was my moment of thinking, enough, we have to do something different. And I started looking online, and I, she found me, and she found others like me who speak, who speak about these issues. And that's what's driven her and compelled her. And, and she says, you know, I click on that video every day. Every day it's a reminder for me. But she said, my friends who are university students who also see that, it turned them into malicious. It has radicalized them to fight. And they also, it continue to click. It's real time, it's not the past. It hasn't been erased, it's not receding. It's ever present. And this is something that is really dangerous if you think about it because there is so much more of that stuff than of the positive stuff. People are dying for the positive stuff. I, I hear it over and over. Where are your voices? Why aren't you in social media? Why aren't you out there? You know, but. It, it's, it's to do with resources, but I think we have to recognize that when you have a war blow by blow on YouTube, that in itself is creating a whole new world that, that we're also unaware of. Can I jump in really quickly on that? Because I think that what you're getting at too is the image is the beginning of a process or a conversation. And I think what we found in this study and what others have found is that it's the importance of that facilitated conversation. That's what the evaluators came back to time and time again. I was at a social norms conference at the Gates Foundation, those people too. Time and time again, it's about the facilitated conversation that happens around the images, that, the stories that we're telling. And they can go one way or they can go the other. But it's about having, you know, so in our project we ended up training like 1,300 facilitators embedded in organizations all around the world. And we, you know, the project ends, but they're still there. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of this work has been about, your work and your work has been about building that capacity and those organizations that can take those stories that we're telling or, or just images that are out there. But the challenge is, I think, how do you do that online? How do you do that in the places where it's actually, um, you don't have access to them? Who are gonna be those facilitators? How do you fund it so it's yes, sustainable? That's right. yeah. And at, well, as you were talking, um, Eric, you know, one of the, the questions I had was whether the, you know, the study that you guys have developed, um, do you have any plans to take that out to funders and to, you know, just to, to kind of make a case for, uh, for investing in this kind of storytelling? Yeah, definitely. And I think it, it's not just this. This is just one. It's a big study. but. Uh, it's just one of many, many out there. And I think it, it's, about a building, it's about a building group of evidence um, about the, what, what can happen with um, documentary film facilitated storytelling, but also other kinds of storytelling. It doesn't have to be documentary film. It doesn't have to be full length things. It can be shorts, it can be animation, it can be, um, you know, edutainment has a role in all this. It's, it's it, just news channels, I mean, everything. And I'll, you know, I just want to jump in because this ties into this question, Maria, that you're asking about how do you embed storytelling as a tool, right? So our team at Just Vision, when we emerged, we knew that um, storytelling was our tool. That, and like every tool, you can use them negatively or positively. Personally, I've seen storytelling play out in a number of ways, right? I grew up in post 9-11. I'm a Muslim, Korean, Christian woman growing up in the United States. And I've seen how narratives that are Islamophobic and xenophobic has not only impacted my direct family and, and FBI surveillance of my family and Muslim communities across the United States, but has also driven entire wars across 
the worlds, right? I've also, I also came out as a queer woman at 15 years old, and as I was organizing, story was my number one tool. Mm -hmm. I told my story and I continue to tell my story and come out every single day. And that's because story, you have to reckon with it. All of a sudden, you have to reckon with my identity, you have to reckon with who I am, you have to check your assumptions, all of these things. And, and so that's what drew me to story, because you have profound capacity for good. Then the question becomes, once you have your story, how do you make sure it's being utilized, that it's being seen, that you literally have eyeballs watching it, that the messages and the themes and the lessons learned are being grappled with by key audiences, that you're reaching those key audiences and those strategic audiences, that you're surfacing very targeted strategy and goals, right? And this is where outreach teams come into play. Um, there are, there's a burgeoning field of impact campaigners who are oftentimes the people that you don't see. I'm gonna point out Emma Alpert in this audience who oversees our outreach in the United States. She's a powerhouse, but you will rarely see her out in the limelight. Um, but she's the one who's making sure that the story in Island Uprising is reaching the right people, that we're facilitating the right conversations, that we're surfacing the right questions as we go. And that's part of how we think about impacts, right? Then there's also the piece about the art of storytelling. And this is, you know, Eric was talking about um, the kind of, uh, the, the kind of iterative process that storytellers will often go through and that sometimes there's a component of this that's just about art for the sake of telling a beautiful story. Um, there's also a component about strategic storytelling, right, where, for example, with Just Vision, we are very specific about the kinds of stories we want to tell, right, and we're actually setting out with a goal and working backwards in the, that storytelling. And um, for example, one of the things that we, we did a few years ago, we released a feature-length film called Budrus. Budrus is a Palestinian village where in 2003 to 2004, they launched a 10-month nonviolent campaign um, to stop the Israeli separation barrier from being built on their lands, which would have confiscated um, and uprooted all of their olive trees, which was the main, live, the main um, livelihood of the community. And the dominant story that was told during that time in the media, in the Israeli mainstream media, in the international media, was that there was, it was a series of riots and clashes of Palestinians and Israeli activists breaking the law and order, thereby justifying their, their arrests and the repression of the movement, right? Riots and clashes, I think we hear that frame when we think about Ferguson and Baltimore and peaceful marches taking place, um, but our cameras tend to zoom in when there's a store on fire, right? Um, what that story missed was that there was a 10-month strategic campaign. So we created Boudreaux, the story of Boudreaux. We released the film in 2009 to actually tell the story as it actually happened on the ground. And one of the things that was amazing, um, the, the public relations firm Edelman, they have a daughter company called Strategy One, they came in to do an independent media audit um, to understand were we actually able to galvanize the kind of narrative change that we were trying to create. And so they looked at the period of 2003 to 2009, 2003 being when the campaign was taking place, 2009 when we released the film, and then 2000, through 2011 after two years of our impact campaign. And they found that 30% of coverage was um, generated from 2003 to 2009. 70% of coverage around Boudreaux came up 2009 to 2011. Why does that matter? Because it means that film actually effectively can galvanize a story, can galvanize coverage. Then the question became, now what kind of, to, did, what? One last thought, sure. because we're gonna open it up here to cool. our audience. Cool. We'd love to hear and the, the story. next question was, what kind of coverage were you generating, right? Because we're interested in the quality of the messages. What are audiences taking away? And they found that we had 98% message penetration. The key themes being focusing on the efficacy of nonviolence, on the importance of women's leadership in that movement, and about the power of unity across divides, specifically around on political factions and welcoming in of Israeli and international activists. That tells you what can happen when you have strategic campaigns built around these films. Um, and when there's the magic hands behind the scenes kind of thinking through how do we reach the right audiences, how do we tell the story, and how do we make sure it has an impact. Excellent point, thank you. We're gonna start, open it up now, and I'm gonna start in this quadrant and then go counterclockwise. Any questions over here? All right, in the back. No questions, are you kidding me? There's a question. Well, we're gonna go right here then, we have one. <laughs> right here, second. Do I, do I have three? Three, 
and then we have four. We have and four also. questions. We're going to do all four questions first, then open it back up to the audience. Sounds good. Thank you so much for... Please introduce yourself. For organizing this, Mir Gulkuns, and I'm originally from Kyrgyzstan, actually a recent resident of GDC. <laughs> uh, so, and you're... I was happy to hear that you were introduced to International Women's Day that way in a small country, right? Of five million people. My first question is a very short one to Ms. Sunderlini. Uh, I had an experience of, uh, I guess, a conversation with the superior, with the boss in the UN structure when uh, I was reporting on violence against women and girls. And to my, I guess, sad face, he said, well, can we, you know, kind of make this story a little happy? So I didn't know how to react. And I kind of realized that you had those experiences. Well, how did you react? And my general question to everyone is, um, among my peers, I mean, anywhere, be it Bishkek or be it uh, DC, I oftentimes, special male uh, peers, I oftentimes hear, why? Why do you care about Women's Day, right? Why there is no Men's Day? And my quick, I guess, answer is, well, you know, when women are happy, men are happy as well. So what do you guys think? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Please. Hi. Go ahead, stand. Yeah. Hi, I am Ham from the Philippines, and um, I am here together with the other 21 um, academic fellows from um, U.S. state-funded program on civic engagement. Um, at the end of our program, we're expected to implement the peace projects in our respective countries. So my question is, um, how do you add um, a gender perspective to our projects despite their focus is not entirely on focused on women's empowerment and on uh, gender equality and how would mainstreaming gender to our projects would help us i mean would benefit our projects thank you great thank you the next right there great thanks Mark. hi my name is margaret Wohler, and i'm the director of the alexandria film festival and my question is for eric um, i was wondering if you've been approached by any documentary filmmakers to embed in the remarkable work that's being done, collaborative work that's being done by the Moms Demand Action Group for Gun Control and also by the Parkland Florida teenagers, um, specifically Emma Gonzalez, to tell their story. Thank you so much. Hi, thanks for the panel. My name is, I don't know if this is working. Yeah, my name is Blake Selzer. I spent the last three years in Jordan working on the Syria conflict. I appreciate all the comments, um, and especially Abigail Disney's comment about those who commit to something they may not see in their lifetime, I think is really important. To that end, you guys have talked about the power of film, especially Sanam. Um, how do you think it's helped, if at all, change um, power structures like in the United Nations and, and the visual images? I know that it's frustrating with your story about the little girl from, or the young woman from Syria. There's been plenty of documentary films about what's happening, including most recently the last minute in Aleppo, but nothing seems to change. So how do you see this affecting that? And lastly, I think sometimes films don't uh, don't start on being advocacy tools, but something like Blackfish, that I think HBO put out all of a sudden now, there's probably no captivity programs for um, killer whales now after that. So it's just want to get some thoughts on those things. Great. One last question, because then I'm going to turn it back over to our panel. OK, that's the last question, and uh, the panelists is going to each one of you can choose which one you want to address. Can I answer the first question about how, oh, Elizabeth. Okay. One question. <laughs> so I'm Elizabeth McBride. I'm a, I'm a journalist and a writer. Um, and my question is um, kind of for all of you on an individual level, which is you're working in this field of peace building. Um, but I imagine sometimes you get really angry at the people that you are um, talking to and coping with. And I just wonder how you kind of balance your role as a peace builder with the passion you need to bring to your work? Interesting question. Yeah. Okay, so there's nothing inconsistent with peace building and anger. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing. It, in fact, the whole point of everything is not that you are or aren't angry, but what do you do about that? You know, so I, if I were angry and I were a warlord, I would pick up a weapon and get it 10,000 guys and, and, and rape and pillage my way through the landscape. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of wars are driven by people who actually say they want to make the world a better place, who are trying to change things structurally. I would imagine that's what 
her friends from Aleppo um, were saying when they went and joined militias. So anger's fine. Um, and I have a lot of it. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, uh, I, tr I try to channel it. Um, but uh, I think of it more as righteous indignation. Um, but the, the, it relates to the first question about making the story happy. Um, and, and you know, we get that a lot. And uh, I come from a family that's famous for making everything happier than it actually is. <laughs> um, but, but honestly, there, that's a actually really deep and important question about the films we make because, um, you know, one of the things I really didn't want to do as a filmmaker was, you know, um, a litany of bad, awful things. I mean, I want people to know how bad it is and who's hurting who, and and I especially want Americans to know that. Um, but I also don't want to leave people feeling less able to fight than more. I mean, what am I trying to accomplish? What's the bigger picture? The, the, the angry thing would be to beat people overhead with the bad news. That would be an angry, that would be emotionally like picking a weapon up. Um, so the, the constructive thing, the thing that will actually change the world is it's not so much to manufacture a happy ending, but to find the redemption. And, and there is redemption in every story. There is, because you know, as long as somebody is standing in a human body and telling you something, they lived through it. And you know, a lot of what women do in conflict that is historic and important and transformative is simply to witness, to bear witness, which is an act in and of itself um, of defiance and, and survival. So, um, I think that it takes, I mean, these are stories that are hard to tell. When I said the hero narrative is something we're enamored with, it's partly because it's an easier story to tell. You know, Aristotle lined it up, the three-act structure and the triangle and the whole thing. I mean, we've been telling hero narratives forever because they're easy. So guess what? We call ourselves creatives. So we need to work harder. And it's hard sometimes to find the redemption, but you go find it. And it's hard sometimes to find the collective, but you go find it. It's hard sometimes to find the footage, but you go find it. Because that's our job um, to tell these stories. And, and it's our job to tell them in a way that will actually make the world a better place, um, which involves sometimes some bad news um, with a little bit of sugar on it. <laughs> Floor is open. I, I was actually. Um, I'm going to answer your question, Eric, Please. Um, partly <laughs> about, uh, about Moms Demand Action. Um, Abby made a really uh, incredible film a few years ago called Armor of Light. Um, the main subject from the film is, I see him here in the audience. Um, and, and that film uh, has been used by Moms Demand Action uh, chapters all over the country. The other main character in the film, Lucy McBath, she was the head kind of faith representative and, and organizer um, for, for Moms Demand Action. And what was so you know, uh, important about how we built the campaign for that film, and I think goes back to Maria, your question about sort of the, the tactics of how you how you do this, how you actually embed films and in movements is that we knew from the very start that the film was going to be embedded in um, in an organization, in a think tank that uh, you know, Rob Shank, the main subject of the film, uh, was was creating. And so we were very intentional about the way we built the campaign so it could be absorbed by an organization that was going to sustain the work. And I think that's so important when you start building an impact campaign. You kind of need to have an exit strategy um, because so often you see you know, filmmakers who they get, a, they get funding for a year maybe for an impact campaign and they do incredible work during that year and they build this whole constituency that kind of maybe never even existed for the film and then the funding runs out and that's it and it's so upsetting to see that happen mm -hmm. and I think one of the, the unique things about Just Vision, about Peace is Loud is that the films we take on um, we're, we're very specific about, about mm -hmm. what, what films we work on and they're within this niche of peace, security, nonviolent organizing and women which means they uh, were coming at it from inside the sort of the, the movements and uh, lastly your question about how you uh, balance your role as a, a peace builder um, you know uh, just it, kind of the, the passion I think that it's um, I think that, you know, I, I found, I don't know if this is true for, for you all, that, you know, a lot of uh, peace builders that, you know, we, we work with, they, they've experienced 
conflict in their in their lives, and and many of them are working for peace because they've never experienced it before. And I think you you do bring um, you know trauma to the work that that you're doing, and 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 that conflict with you. And I think even the um, the process of recognizing that and and sort of holding that in 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 in, in your work can be really helpful. So, so um, a couple so, of things uh, in my. I mean, yeah, I was in Colombia uh, in 2010 at a time when the word peace could not be mentioned. Okay, so think about the changes. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to these women who had been displaced and they were trying to figure out how to do their life, you know, get on with their lives. And they'd been given bits of land, but it was the land that they'd given the women were of the soil was of worse quality than, than, than others and they hadn't been given fertilizer and all these things. And then I was talking to the UN, I don't know, representative for human rights or something like that. And she, and she was like, oh, it's so desperate and there's just nothing we can do. And I looked at her and I, you know, and I've, I've never really worked fully for the UN. I've worked as a consultant. I've always been in the NGO sector. But honestly, I looked at her and I, and I said, I'm sorry, but you know, you get paid too much to be cynical, <laughs> right? I mean, if they can be hopeful, um, we, you, international, if you dare to be in that space, you, you put your cynicism, you parked it back home because you're being paid to be here and you have to be you have to recognize that you're there to help. So, so that cynicism that, that weighs down these institutions and the people in them is I think one of the biggest four sources of inertia. Now, what do I, how do I deal with this? Um, part of it is that I see the absurdity and, and part of the reason why I started doing the animations was because, was because I was like, what you say is so absurd. How is it that you only bring, as I say, bring armed actors or your, the, challenging the legitimacy of the women, but you know, three guys with a gun and, and, and three guys with a suit that say, oh, by the way, we're the representatives of country X. We, we, you know, we fly them here and there, and, and they're legitimate. So, so it's, there's, a, there's an absurdity that's there that, that I think we have to, to expose. Um, and, and I'll say just two, two, two more thoughts. One is that part of this, as, as I move on in this field, um, is actually I want to do it through drama and fiction and storytelling. Because what I see in the realms that I'm in, it's a mixture of MASH and, and uh, The Office and um, <laughs> you know, whatever, the House of Cards. And, and there, there used to be a TV series in England called Mind Your Language, which was about different language, you know, people from different cultures kind of communicating and, and lost in translation. That's what it is. It's, and I used to be so kind of in awe of, oh my God, the mediation work. It's Wizard of Oz, right? So, so we have to get in there. You have to challenge it. You have to question it. So that's one space. And I'm like, that's why I want to go into this space of drama, because I think that's where we can actually tell the stories of who's out there. The second um, thought for me is that I really wish that, that one of the criteria for working for an international organization was the, your ability to care. Right, as opposed to caring for power, the power of caring goes a long way. You see amazing individuals who, despite all the adversity, are pushing things. It's only because they care. We do this because we care, right? So caring should be one of the criteria that, that, that we look for. And then finally, in terms of mainstream media, I just want to ask, how many of you in the last seven years have seen a Syrian peace activist on CNN, MSNBC, Al Jazeera, or whatever TV news you watch? Put your hands up. Okay. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of them, right? The media, the mainstream media is interested in kneecappings. I remember this in 2000, uh, a New York Times a, a journalist said to me, oh, you know, kneecappings in Northern Ireland. And I'm like, they happen every day. Why don't you do, do deal with the peace activists? They don't want to do that, do that story. We as the public need to be asking the mainstream media, where are these voices? bring them on. And we don't need to see their faces because it might be insecure. Show their hands and feet. Come to me. I will introduce you to the folks that are willing to go on TV to talk about what's happening. But, but it's as if they don't matter, right? And if they're not on the news and if they're not on Farid Zakaria and they're whatever, then they don't exist. And the point is that they need to exist for then the UN and the international community and others to actually believe that there is a solution because to be honest with you, peace is inevitable, war is not. And yet at the moment, it seems as if war is inevitable. It happens, you know, God decides that we go to war. It doesn't, that men are deciding this or people are deciding. And, and meanwhile, peace is going on all the time and yet it's invisible to us. So peace is the inevitability and we should be changing the paradigm of thinking that war is inevitable. And I wanna just jump in to, um, a couple, to, to respond to a couple of questions, including the gentleman's question up in the back. Um, you asked the question about how do you integrate gender, a gender lens when your focus is not primarily a gender lens, right, or a gender focus. Um, we're in the same boat, right? So our work 
is focusing on grassroots leaders broadly in Palestinian and Israeli society. We tell stories about communities organizing on the ground. And we incorporate a gender lens throughout our body of work because we believe that women's voices are critical, not only essential as in reflecting the whole, the, the sort of entirety of the communities on the ground and who's activating and what's actually happening, but as actually incredibly important in, in building movements that are pluralistic and the kind of societies that we want to see the day after, right? And so what I would encourage you to do is it's phenomenal that um, when organizations, when teams that are working on other issue areas incorporate a gender lens throughout their body of work, you don't have to be one or the other. You can actually be both, and it's really healthy for us to be incorporating and integrating across movements and issue areas like this, right? So that's one, and I'm happy to talk offline more about your specific projects, because I, I think I heard a little bit about wanting some advice around how you can do that, and I'm happy to go there with you. Um, the second piece about this peace and anger piece, I actually want to come back because it's to this because it's important when we think about, you know, when I think about the Israeli-Palestinian context, time and again, um, folks that we work with have um, come to understand peace as empty. The word peace as a very empty word. Um, what it reflects for a lot of the folks that we work with are meaningless coffee table conversations um, where you're told to go and get to know the other and then nothing really happens afterward. They go back, Palestinians go back to their homes through checkpoints, finding their, their homes demolished in some cases, another uncle sent off to prison, so on, and it's just the same. No, there's actually no challenge of the structural inequality that's taking place. And I think this is, and, and, and I think this is a, a challenge for us, right? Because what it means is that we need to put teeth to things like te peace. We actually have to do work that comes along with changing our societies. And what doesn't trigger are the scenes of these incredible women who are doing this real work who call and will be proud to claim their identities as peace builders, right? And, and so I, I want to say that there's a piece about for me, part of the reason I got involved in this work is because I felt a lot of emotion about a lot of things and I needed some way to channel it and this is how I found it. And then there's the reality of understanding how um, these words land and how do we actually make them have meaning, right? And, and there's a lot of important work to be done um, to, to make sure that these this is legitimate that people understand what this means and that we think about and really interrogate what our strategies and peace building are in affecting change, right? So that's the piece that I wanted to include in this conversation because I think, you know, peace, security, you could have, these things, these words are very broad. They can be defined as national security. They can be defined as human security. You could look at it from a number of different angles and actually getting concrete about what we're talking about becomes so essential to, um, getting precision in the work that we're doing. Eric? I don't know what's left. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, something that I think all the questions touch on is that there's a role for everyone in this equation, especially on the storytelling side, thinking about from fiction, from documentary, from uh, shorts, from animation to YouTube, Anything, I think, that includes that authentic voice that we talk about, which I think can genuinely be the spark of the changes that everybody is, is looking for. Um, but I, and I also think that for all of you, in no matter what you're doing, it's also the way that, as we say, you listen to those stories and you carry those stories out. I mean, in some ways, that's what the research that we did was really, really found, was that it, it was what happened after the stories were told. The stories had to be told, but it's what happens after the stories. It's what happened, what do you do with that spark? What do you do when the women say, they did that there, what do we do? And that's a role that, that every one of you can play in all of your daily lives around media, around things that you see on Facebook, maybe in your jobs, um, and making sure not only that those stories get told, which we know now have measurable impact, um, but also about how are you facilitating the conversation um, and how are your organizations doing that? And I think if we, if we had a world where more organizations had embedded facilitators about those conversations using media, no matter what the organization did, all of this media would have more of a place to go and a way to have an impact. And I think that's what these studies are showing. So can I, can I finish by taking Please. us back yeah. to 30,000 feet? Take us back. I live at 30,000 feet. Mm -hmm. um, 
<laughs> actually, it's really a problem. But <laughs> um, I had the very distinct honor um, and unique experience of spending some days in North Korea a couple of years ago. And um, it was so interesting because at one point we had this big um, round table discussion, very much like I had in, in Srebrenica, where a lot of women who had distinct and very traumatic memories of the war um, told us about it. And I was so amazed at how alive that war was in that room. It was alive. These were stories being told to me as if they happened last week. Um, and I thought, well, what are the North Koreans doing to their people to cause them to have this living war inside of them? They must be, it must be the propaganda, it must be whatever. And then I thought, that's really interesting because as an American, I'm very nonchalant about the Korean War. It was a long time ago because we've had so many wars <laughs> since then. And what's so interesting is that war has been almost a constant in this country, um, in the 20th century almost, um, and yet ne it never happens here. Um, it never happens here <laughs> to us. And so it's kind of stunning um, that most Americans don't really understand the extent to which we leveled North Korea. We leveled it. And if there is sadness and bitterness, um, it is well earned. And if it has been festering, it's because there's never been a reconciliation. There's never been a reckoning of, of any kind. So what we can do in this country, um, if we want to build peace, is first remember that we are not a country at peace and, and try to recognize and remind the people around us that we are not a country living at peace. We haven't been in a very long time. Um, and that that has to change. The attitude toward peace and the attitude toward war has to change. I actually had a, a general from the Marine Corps say to me, I wish I could get my guys when I recruit them in a very different frame of mind. I don't want them bloodthirsty when they get to me. I wish I could dial that back in them. But they've been so primed by their popular culture to want to go out and find the bodies uh, that I don't really know, I have to do a lot of unlearning with them. So first of all, you can do something, everybody's always wondering, what's my job, what's my job? Help your fellow Americans understand the role that we play in global conflict. And then the other thing is, media makes reality. It just does. So stop rewarding the media that is generating the reality we live. Stop rewarding it. Don't go to a Michael Bay film. Don't send your children to a Michael Bay film. I'm sorry, but he's my betoir. I can't stand him. <laughs> he doesn't have a soul. Um, and reward the stuff that does. Reward Selma. You know, reward hidden figures. We're, we're, there are many, many films. Oh my god, The Shape of Water. Such an amazing, there are a million things to reward it and a million things to punish, and you've got the wallet to do it with. And nothing in this country is stronger than your wallet. Um, so, so that's a bit of activism that you can, you can take right out of this room with you. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think uh, you'll join me and uh, Maria. No, thank you very much. This was a, <laughs> incredibly and a great way to end it. And I, I love the point too earlier that women ruin war. That's the point. So thank you all very much for a great conversation. Join us. Thank you.